I want to talk about something I don't think you and I have ever talked about. So about three or four weeks ago, the dollar was on par with the euro, right? So, hey, if you want to travel to Europe, this is the summer to do it. Uh, with what we saw on Friday, again, topic number one was the Fed being clear. Rates are going higher. Rates are staying longer. The dollar has reascended and now setting even higher highs. But I know there's two things to be true. The strong dollar is going to hurt two things for sure and may hurt others. First, there are emerging markets like Sri Lanka who, are, who have dollar-denominated debt that are going to be in real trouble. Second, international companies who sell goods around the world in foreign currencies that have to convert back to the dollar are going to be hurt because the do- it'll, just, it'll be less because the dollar is so strong. So I have a sneaky suspicion one of the things not being talked about there is just how strong the dollar gets and how much pain that could cause around the world. What do you think? Yeah, it's a big issue with trade, you know, and like you said other other governments that have their debt denominated in dollars. We already saw earnings last round uh, a couple of companies that had some losses and and didn't meet um, guidance because of the, you know, the dollar strength. Microsoft and called for, it out, for example. Yeah. 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 For that very reason. So, you know, being, you know, a globalized economy like we are as globally connected as we are, which is why, you know, I'm a global macro investor, even though I invest in the United States only, I don't invest abroad in emerging markets. That's just not my thing. Um, I still watch it because it affects everything we do here. Uh, the global recession. So there's big energy issues, you know, abroad in Europe, especially uh, the dollar is an issue for for you know emerging markets and other countries, like you said. And there's a domino of some of these you know countries that like Sri Lanka that are you know, lined up behind them, Venezuela. You know, I mean, you just go on and on and on. Yeah. That as the dollar rises, as energy goes up, as food you know becomes more of an issue due to you know the war in Ukraine and other issues. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very, very fragile environment out there, and you know, as goes the world, as you know, goes the economy of the United States. Yeah, that's that's what I'm looking at now. And again, this is not something that will like roll up on our doorstep tomorrow, but it's out there. Yeah, it's not going to tank us either, you know, or anything like that. Like, you know, if the world start, you know, these these smaller emerging markets start collapsing, it's not going to kill us, but it's going to affect trade. It's going to affect the ability to get things and it's going to affect, you know, things in general. But um, it it could affect liquidity. (laughs) Right. Which may, you know, again, that's something that we've been talking about for a while. Like, again, I think QT rising, quantitative tightening versus quantitative easing, I think it kicks in more in September. It's get, it gets up to the next tier of activity. I, I'm actually watching the strong dollar. It, it did spike again on Friday, and it's continued to spike this morning. It, it, um, it Again, it's not something that I think shows up on our shores tomorrow, but it could be one of those nasty surprises if we get into a recession. Again, housing's in a depression, economy's in a recession. Uh, Europe's clearly in a recession. We have more emerging markets show pain. You just you just can't help everybody if all of this comes at the same time, which I think is a risk for next year. Well, you know, it's just a global reckoning. So we've been on a QE, easy money, yeah, the world has liquidity yeah. path globally since two thousand eight nine, and we should have let things unwind back then. Yeah. And and naturally reoccur and reset the economy back then, it didn't happen. Mm-mm. So now we're facing that fine line of almost an inevitable choice of having to reset the global economy, and of uh, you know w- w- avoid collapse you know mm-hmm. uh, of global economies around the world. But I think we're at a point now where we can't kick the can down the road anymore. I think it's come home to roost. And yeah. what's really interesting is the, you know, the monetary theorists out there, you know, the cases are really being tested. We've seen Japan, you know, what their, yeah. you know, path Decades. looks like and, and how Decades yeah, and how that's affected them. So it, it's a very interesting time. And all of this is, you know, this whole conversation is about, you know, wealth preservation, right? You want to have capital available for when things do reset mm-hmm. so you can take advantage of opportunities. And now is not the time. I mean, a lot of people are saying, oh, everything's on sale. I'm going to load up and this and that. Yeah. This isn't the time. We haven't not gotten yet. there yet. <laughs> not yet. Yeah. yeah. We're not in the all clear. When inflation peaks and starts coming back down, when the Fed says we're plat, we're done, we don't need to raise anymore, yeah. we're good when here. When they pause, yeah. And, and when they can actually start unloading the balance sheet without tanking the economy, you know, then you can say, okay, we've got the all clear and we can look for that base and we can we can start looking for better times ahead. But 
you know, this is this is a super bubble in all assets everywhere around the world that, you know, it, it, it needs to unwind at some point. You've got to have a rebalancing at some point. Yeah, I don't, it's a natural I, business cycle. You know, it's agreed. just a business cycle. Yeah. I don't know if you saw it, but Ray Daly over the weekend was quoted talking about uh, given given the Fed's again, Ray Daly basically saying given the Fed's clear message on Friday, he fears that the stock market has a 20 to 25 percent downside from Friday's close. Basically repricing assets back to like risk assets and yeah. earnings. And he's talking about the strong dollar. Obviously, Ray Dalio is a worldwide investor. He's got capital everywhere. He's like, the strong dollar is going to, it's going to hurt some. It's, it's, it, the strong dollar feels good if you want to be a, if you're a U.S. consumer going out, but it hurts a lot of the rest of the world. Yeah. It's really funny how last week, Monday, Tuesday, Potentially, people were talking about retesting all-time highs. To yes, exactly. Now they're all talking about twenty, another twenty percent down. That's with Powell's eight-minute speech. That's all it took, eight minutes. <laughs> well, and again, that's the credibility of the Fed. That's what's that on the line. That's what's right. been on the line. The markets were like, "Dude, you're not serious. We're, yeah. we're not. You're not a serious individual." You know, that's what that rally was all about. It was telling the Fed, "You people have no clue. You're a joke. And you're not serious." Yeah. yeah. Right. And, you know, so the pal, you know, he, he has to stand up because his legacy yes. is on the line. But more I importantly agree. than that, the American consumer is on the line. If they don't do something, again, you're going to see people marching in the streets. When you can't feed your kids and you can't put a roof over their heads because it just, you know, wages aren't keeping up with everything else, that's when people take to the streets. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't want that. We're seeing it in Sri Lanka. We're seeing it in, you know, Venezuela. We're seeing it in Argentina. I mean, you're seeing it in these countries around the world where that's what's going on because they cannot feed their families and they can't keep a roof over their head. And, mm -hmm. you know, he does not want to be known as the absolute biggest buffoon the Fed has ever seen. And that's the path he was on. Yeah. Yeah. Again. And, and I want to call it out. I, I think we're going to find out September 21st, three short weeks away. Cause I think if Powell delivers anything but 75 basis points, the market's going to just laugh. It's going to be like, see, we knew it. He's a clown. He's a jokester. He talks tough, but he's weak. I think he has to deliver well, 75. I don't know about I... that. You know, it's going to, the inflation print's going to be the guy. So okay. if inflation is down, well, then, you know, they can easily, they, they no, don't have to see, go 75. So let's play with it. So again, I think the inflation print was 8.3 last time, I think. So eight let's, five. yeah, 8.5, eight, 8.3, eight, something like that. So let's talk about what down means. So if, so again, this is this is an important conversation, folks, because let's remember last time headline came down. Core did not core did not move. I want people to watch this. We're, we're getting a lot of talking heads talk about peak inflation and all of these things. Folks, gas is down like 78 days in a row. That's headline core did not move. So what I want to kind of put out there, let's say headline comes down to 7.5, which I don't think anybody's calling for, but let's just get wacky with it. But core doesn't move again. He has to go 75. I don't, th I don't think this is about headline. I think it's about core. What do you think? Well, I think they should. So just to be clear, I okay. think they should do another 75. Okay. And then if you want to hold or back off, you know, from there, if the data, you know, indicates, but they said we're going to be data dependent. Yeah, they so, did. Until we see those reports, it's hard to say what they're going to do. If it's a better than expected report, you know, in either core headline, whatever, I think they might go 50 because you do okay. have a couple of Fed members saying even yeah. last week, yeah, you know, that 50 is still a hike. That's still a lot. You know, they're saying, hey, yeah. we, we've hiked a lot from where we came from and 50 is even still substantial. But most of them said, you know. 75 is definitely realistic and doable, yeah. but they're, they're saying 50 is not off the table. So yeah, I don't I think, think we should. I'm not even sure when, when um, Volcker was in, I actually should go look this up. I don't think we've ever had three meetings of 75 in a row. I have to look that up. I don't even think. Yeah, Volcker. I don't did. know. I don't know. Yeah. It's, I, it's hard I, to say, but Volcker raised rates more than the other fed, but I don't think he ever did three quarters, three times in a row. He did intermeeting. He did weekends. But I don't think he did three, three quarters in a row. I, I should go look that up. I'm going to go look that up. So, so that's going to be the conversation for the next two weeks is the 50, yeah. 75. You know, what do they do? What do they do? And until we get the inflation, we don't know because they're well, data they, dependent. And they are. But let's talk about Friday. We're going to get that number this week before you and I talk next week. I think there's a jobs number. I think expectations is like 238 or 250. I think there's a good chance we surprise to the upside and get like 400. Again, yeah. I think good news is bad news. I think we pull a 400. We see wages go up, you know, a percent or two. 
it's just going to be like, nope, there goes 75. Because again, you got to hit the job market. The one thing he's pointing at is the job market, right? If we get a strong jobs number, I don't even care if headline comes down. We get a strong jobs number Friday. He's got to do 75, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that gives him more of a basis and a reasoning to do that. And I think the market can start expecting it. And I think they're already starting to price in that. You know, yeah, uh, they haven't so. done it yet, but I think the markets are in the process. I don't know where this minute where the Dow is, but it opened down, yeah, you know, 300 this morning. Let's check. Yeah. So, you know, the markets are in the process of trying to get ahead of that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah, we've got some fireworks coming up. And yeah. September's, you know, the last couple of times the Fed was on this path, September, October, November, were not good months. We're not good months, exactly. I don't, it's uh, one of my buddies who's a stock guy on, on Sundays. He actually did the research since 1948. September is actually the worst month, historically speaking, for the stock market. So buckle up, folks. We're heading into September. <laughs> it has been for Bitcoin, too. There's only been three or four up September, up months in September oh, in wow. Bitcoin's history. And they were all in the early, you know, first three or four years. Wow, I didn't know, did not know that. Mr. Greg Dickerson, where can people find you? Yep, gregdickerson.com. Go awesome. check it out. Thanks, buddy.